Hey there, and welcome to Becoming a Bowhunter. I'm your host, Matty. Join me and our guests as we take the quality of meat back into our own hands. Searching the wild for free-ranged animals to harvest as ethically as we can. I interview a variety of specialists from the bow hunting community to help fast track your journey as a bow hunter. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this chinwag on one of your favorite topics in the world, bow hunting. Becoming a Bow Hunter is brought to you by Chief Dads. Chief Dads is my little program that I kickstarted at the start of this year and the start of 2020 and really it's been an absolute gangbuster. It's been unreal to see the results that we've had with different dads from around the country. Um, it's pretty much your nutrition encompassed with your training as well as we really dive into lifestyle and that's the biggest piece. Each week we touch on a new lifestyle piece and we really train you to, uh, I guess, out train bad habits and really focus focus on what lifestyle habits are the best things for you to be doing, the best practices, um, and the things that give you the best return for not a lot of output. So that's what the program is all about. And I've worked with plenty of dads, like I said before, but the program is designed for men within Australia who want to lose some weight, who want to gain their fitness back, who want to really take control of their life. And that's why um, I'm putting it out to you as the bow hunting community, because I feel like there's a few people in this category that would really love that, would love to see better fitness for not only their their own personal gain in, in bow hunting and in archery in general, but also obviously the side of looking after your family and providing for your family and being the best version of you to be able to give back to your family so if you guys wanted to reach out if you want to yeah, find out any more information about that you can reach out to me at uh, becoming a bow hunter dot podcast on instagram or you can hit up chiefdads.com that's chief c-h-i-e-f d-a-d-s dot com um, for more information on the chief dads program Team, what is up? Have an absolute cracker of an episode for you guys today uh, with Luke Cameron. And it was interesting. We, we had the conversation afterwards. Luke actually said to me, hey, mate, um, there's a there's a, that bit about the scrub balls. And, and I, I just wonder if maybe we should cut it out because... Uh, uh, like I guess the the biggest thing is that we don't want cowboys running around the freaking country going and shooting people's cattle. And I thought, hey, this is actually a really good insight, uh, and probably something that we should talk up as an educational piece instead. So really, the, there's a bit of a waiver that I'm going to put on it. And all all I'm saying is, don't go don't go and shoot cattle. Don't go and be an idiot with a bow. Like know what you're hunting, know how you can hunt them, um, and realistically get get approval from your property owners before you go and do anything stupid. So. This comes down to in this talk in particular, we talk about going after scrub bulls, and we go we talk about going after scrub cattle in general. And Luke says that he, he's fortunate enough to have the opportunity to go and harvest some of these guys for meat. But that's because he talks with his owners. He he knows the owners. He knows the cattle really well, um, and they trust in him to go out and do the the right job, which he's always done. So I think realistically, the biggest thing with this one is is use it as insight to hey, this is a possibility if you've got permission from your owners and if you know exactly what you're going after i think that's the the best way or the clearest way to state this before you guys even hear what he has to say about it and i know that scrub balls in particular is quite a hard one like i know aba don't actually even um even approve of them yet because they don't want anyone to go out and be be an idiot on the property and i think realistically it's it's for us as bow hunters we need to take responsibility of this um this situation ourselves and understand the fact that we we have the right to go out and go hunting or we're lucky enough to get that that pri- we're privileged really is the way to say it um to go out and hunt on some of these properties and if you gain access that you you need to take responsibility and, and give the utmost respect to um that property and that that landholder and and also the animals that you're chasing so um realistically i think we've seen some ridiculous stupid things happening within uh with bows with arrows um i've seen stuff on facebook which is really disappointing like dogs getting shot kangaroos getting shot um cattle getting shot and people finding arrows in these animals later down track because it's been a silly shot and i would like to think that everyone listening to this podcast is of the mindset of the same mindset as me and really um doing doing 
justice to bow hunting and bow hunters and not going out and doing anything ridiculous. So um, that's a little bit of a waiver. I just wanted to cover over on this one, but I think you guys are in for a real treat. This this talk is really awesome. It's all about Northern Territory and the opportunities that the Luke and the Cameron boys have had up there. So um, yeah, get down, knuckle down, do your part for the sport and um, or for bow hunting, I should say, the passion, the purpose, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this one and yell out to myself or the Cameron boys if you want to hear anything more. All righty, bow hunters, welcome back. I'm sitting here with Luke Cameron. Welcome, Luke. Thanks, mate. Thanks very much for having me on. Ah, I'm super stoked. So on Instagram, you are Cameron outside bow hunting, um, and it's really quite cool because you're kind of capturing not only your journey but also your your brother's and your dad's journey as well. Yeah, sure. So. I mean, it's always been a bit of a family thing, um, walking around with a bow for us fellas with, with our brothers and our old men. So, um, yeah, we just started the page and, and yeah, it was sort of, yeah, it's all of us and, um, yeah, what do we sort of get up to? Yeah, I really envy that. I think that's incredible. I, um, it's definitely – so uh, it was funny. When I bought my bow, my dad was actually making his own bow for home. Um, like, and he's just bought – just got different, um, like, logs, essentially, that he's dried out and made into bows, and he keeps snapping them. But it's just cool oh, yeah. that he's got that interest in, in doing that. And I, I don't know where his head's at with the whole hunting thing yet. Like, I've been talking to him – I talk to him about it all the time, and he's fascinated by it, but I just don't know if he's into the, the concept of coming out. But – um, it's funny, both my dad and my brother kind of went down a bit of the, the vegetarian or vegan route, but were always the, the types that would, um, every time they got away from, it was pretty much because their partners influenced them to do it, but every time they got away from it, like from their partners, they would go and eat bulk meat. And so every time they came over here, I was always cooking them big meat meals. <laughs> um, and so it's just interesting because I want to spin them. I want to take them hunting and then take them out in the, in the ovals to do it with me. Uh, and I'm just working on them bit by bit as I go. My brother actually came out hunting with me and it was just, it, it, there's a, a special bond that you build with people when you're out in the field. That's for sure. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. And, um, you know, being, being family sort of to start with and then spending a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah in the bush and um yeah you, you do become pretty close to um to those people yeah so but no it's it's great it's um yeah i couldn't really think of being out there without those boys most of the time like yeah it'd be a bit foreign yeah definitely i think it's yeah it's nice you just have a, a camaraderie that gets built from hardship i think is is probably the best way to put it or the easiest way to put it but um yeah i, I think obviously it just gives you more time with the people that um that you also care about which is unreal yeah most definitely for sure and so luke tell us a little bit more about yourself mate you're up in uh, northern territory up in catherine or just outside of catherine yeah so um from from crindor new south wales originally that's where i grew up um sort of left school and moved sort of into northern queensland and then um Kept going after a few years and ended up up here in Catherine, um, helicopter pilot. So, um, yeah, work sort of brought me up this way originally. Um, just with the mustering industry, uh, you know, it's quite a bigger deal in northern Australia than it probably is anywhere else in the country. Yeah. Um, that's, that's sort of what I wanted to, to do. That's why, I, you know, got my licence and, um, you know, so this place is sort of the place to be if, if that's what you're looking for. And, um, I mean, it's evolved into a few different avenues now uh, from what it started. You yeah, sort of do some bushfires work over the summer these days in New South Wales as well. Um, but, yeah, originally, yeah, that's how it came to me in Catherine is just, yeah, mustering cattle in the chopper and... Um, yeah, that's that's sort of what we spend our year doing, yeah. Yeah, it's unreal. And we talked a bit about it before uh, the podcast started, but I think it's absolutely an awesome job. And I just was telling you how reminiscing based on when I was growing on the property, uh, we definitely had the the guy come out in the helicopter and it was, um, yeah, as a young kid watching that, it was absolutely fascinating. I think it's so cool. But how far does your job kind of take you then? Like you'd be pretty widespread um, around Northern Territory, wouldn't you? Definitely, mate. Yeah, we go as far south. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of Tennant Creek area. Yep. Is sort of our, not our limit. We have been, you know, further south with different jobs and so forth, but, you know, on a regular basis, um, you know, we don't venture very far past Tennant. 
Um, you know, we go as far north as, as you know, the Darwin region, um, all the way up to the Western Australia border. And, um, you know, all the way as far east as the, as the Queensland border on the Calvert River there. So yeah, wow. uh, you definitely have a good look around uh, the state of the Northern Territory, yeah. Yeah, it's unreal. And so, um, I mean, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into the Northern Territory stuff because that's where, obviously, you guys do a lot of your hunting. But, um, like, being being having access to farmers like that, do you think that's given you a one-up in your hunting, um, in your, like, hunting for you guys in general? Yeah, undoubtedly, mate. Like, you know, um, being involved with the pastoral industry and getting to meet managers of, you know, various different places – you know, um, you know, you build a relationship over time and, you know, and you're there flying around, mustering cattle, you know, you're seeing what wildlife's around, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and it, it doesn't really take all that long before you can, you know, sort of figure out whether it's worth coming for a walk there or if it's not worth your time. But, you know, it's, it's definitely given us or myself, um, you know, a real edge yeah, uh, I- being able to. At what point do you drop it into conversation that you're a bow hunter? <laughs> um, oh, you know, obviously not straight away, mate. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, there is, you know, there's plenty of people out there that, that sort of do the wrong thing and leave a yeah, bad definitely. taste in people's mouths. So you don't want to go and, um, you know, go telling or, you know, opening your mouth too much until you sort of get to know someone, um, you know, inevitably it'll come out. Um, through people you know that also work there or, or colleagues, you know, if you're there with a few other guys doing some flying, um, sooner or later, yeah, the topic will come up and, and um, you know, people find out you do a bit of bow hunting and that. But, um, but yeah, you know, definitely don't run in there and uh, <laughs> introduce yourself. Exactly. Yeah, for sure, you know, yeah. yeah. I like to, um, yeah, just sort of just poke along and, um, yeah, just get to know people first and then, Obviously, I don't know. I sort of would think it was a bit rude just to uh, oh, introduce definitely. yourself on the first day and then then ask for access, you know. But um, yeah, no, it, it, it's definitely given me a great great uh, way of being able to go to, to places you otherwise wouldn't wouldn't get to and. Um, yeah, ask for access and, and get onto a few places. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's interesting with um with COVID, I feel that bow hunters or archery bow bow aunt, bow owners, I should say, sorry, has probably increased a lot. Um, like I went to the shop, the archery shop, the other day, and I've never seen it so bare. But at the same time, I've never seen it so full with people, um, which I think oh, really? is absolutely awesome. Like it, it's cool that it's getting more people to be outdoors and be shooting bows and stuff. But unfortunately, with that, obviously comes the dickheads as well. And there was a, a case out at Ipswich um, near where I live like I'm in Brisbane but yeah out at Ipswich there was a guy that was shooting at people uh, shot someone through the leg and shot at a, a runner um, and he's been charged with intent intent to kill so I think it's yeah. great that he's been charged properly but at the same time it also things like that are so damaging to um, individuals like ourselves or not individuals but to the, the bow hunting community as a whole um, and I think it, it also goes part and part with how people introduce themselves to a, a property owner and how that kind of gets taken. And I, I guess the hard thing is like, obviously you want to start a conversation with them, but at the same time, if you just letterbox dropping um, or, or door knocking, it can be quite hard to kind of like, that is exactly what you're saying. Like introducing yourself to say, Hey, I'm a bow hunter and I want access to your property. It, it's not realistically maybe the best way to go about it, but it, it's kind of like, hey, how else do you do it if you're not within the industry where you're seeing those people? Yeah. For sure, yeah. And, you know, if, if, how else do you do it? Like, at some point, you, yeah, unless you know someone, you know, through another line of work or, you know, a friend of a friend or something, yeah, yeah, you know, you really do have no choice but to... Uh, just just yeah go and knock on the door i guess but um yeah like you can understand if they say no just to a stranger sort of turning up but um i guess yeah, you don't really have a lot of avenues no to, exactly uh, you know you can be the, the nicest guy on earth but you know until that person gets to know you they're probably going to be a bit uh, standoffish yeah and 100 percent understandably like if they're not getting people out to their their properties that much especially just randoms driving in off the street it's um it's understandable that they might be a bit kind of up on edge when you first rock up yeah for sure yeah oh uh, mate so tell us a little bit more about how you kind of got into bow hunting 
Uh, so just as kids, you know, probably a lot like other people, we, um, you know, we were always cutting tree branches off and, you know, mm. finding a bit of string and just making a bit of an old bow out of what we could find and just shooting, you know, we wouldn't, not even arrows, just yeah, bits of stick and, <laughs> and uh, whatever you could find really around the backyard. Uh, and then it was probably, I think I would have been about 10 and the other boys, you know, Dad must have been about eight and Jake would have been sort of six. Uh, but for Christmas one year, Dad got us uh, like a proper recurve each. Yeah. And some proper timber arrows and um, we thought we were pretty deadly then. And <laughs> so then we had a proper setup and, um, you know, it went from there and we shot those until they just about snapped in half and we got a bit older and we saved our money and we started to buy like, you know, a proper compound bow each and, um, it sort of grew from there until, you know, into our teens. Uh, and then, yeah, you know, probably got brought undone a bit by um, beer and women when we discovered it. <laughs> yeah. And they'll both, the bow got hung up there for a few years. But, um, yeah, we you know, obviously got right back into it these days. Who brought it back out first? Jake, I reckon, bought a bow uh, out of us all again first and then yeah it didn't take too long Dano then grabbed one um because those those guys both down south hunting together again and then yeah it wasn't too long after that um yeah that I went and grabbed another one and we got back into it and yeah we haven't looked back you know we're 20 times worse bloody obsessed by bow hunting now (laughs) than we ever were growing up uh so yeah it's definitely a a massive part of our lifestyle again. Um, but, yeah, no, I think Jake, Jake grabbed that first one and then it, it was a bit of a – it spread pretty quick. Yeah, that's unreal. I think it's a, it's an awesome passion to kind of be able to share together as well. For sure, yeah. And Very, so- um, it is a bit of a shame that, you know, you, you do pick it up again and realise just what you've been missing and how much you enjoy it. Um, and you sort of think, geez, wonder wonder what I could have achieved – had I got back into it a bit earlier again, you know. Definitely. And, um, yeah. But anyhow, we're uh, we're back into it now and we're not looking back. Yeah, no, that's unreal, mate. And so when it comes to, um, I guess, your, your huntings up in Northern Territory, like uh, there's a lot of different animals up there and a lot of different opportunities. But what are, what are your kind of, like, what do you go after the most? What do you like chasing? Uh, pigs, definitely, mate. My number one. Um, yeah, I, I could just shoot pigs. For the rest of my life, I reckon, if I, if I, you know, was forced into it, yeah, but, um, yeah I, I just like enjoy shooting big boars, um, find you know seeking them out and um, and getting it done on them. You know, there is, I've shot buffalo and there is plenty of those walking around up here, um, but you know, they really don't do much for me, um, buffalo unless you know unless he's a pretty good bull or something and. The opportunities there, but I won't go and look for a big bull like I will for a big bull. Yeah, uh, you know what I mean. Like, yeah, that's just what I enjoy and um, what I like doing the most out of sort of hunting any animal up up this way. Yeah, and so I mean, it's pretty pretty different country, no matter where you are in Australia, really. And up there, it's quite um, it's quite like floodlands and flatlands, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, in parts, um, that floodplain country, definitely, you know. It's wet most of the year, so uh, once everything else is dried out, you know, there is a lot of pigs that stay in the floodplain area and there's food, you know, all year round for them. Uh, they don't have to <clears throat> really look too hard for it. It's easy for them to survive out there. Is it you know, just all water. bulbs and stuff and, and, like, grasses they're eating or is it mainly, um, like, carrion and stuff? Uh, they'll eat carrion as well um, where they can find it, but... You know, there is a lot of, yeah, like grasses and bulbs and tree roots and, and different stuff for them. Um, you know, yeah, there's just a bloody endless supply. It's just a vast, vast area of, yeah, you know, feed up to your knees, if not higher there, um, you know, especially in the early part of the year. Yeah. So, you know, they, they, they're not left wanting for anything, um, but you will find them elsewhere, you know, up in that red country, on the ridge country, Um yeah, it makes it a little easier, especially this time of year, if you can just find a bit of a water source in that red 
Red Ridge country, a lot of the time uh, it will have got burnt over the course of the dry season. Like a lot of the territory, uh, they burn it off. Yeah. So, you know, if you've got if you've got one puddle of water, you know, within a 5K or a 10K radius and it's 37 degrees and 60, 70, 80% humidity, yeah, it, uh, you find that water and you'll find the pigs. Do, do you um, just kind of sit off the water or would you um, – or you, you just walk around and you find them there? Yeah, I'll, I'll move around. You can sit there all day and, and you will get them, but – um, I don't know. I just prefer to cover a bit more area and, and look around. Yeah. You know, especially if, if you've got a good run of broken water holes or something, it makes for a sort of better day out than just sitting in the shade on a log waiting for something to come in. Yeah, but, I'm, uh, I'm definitely of the same mindset. and I'm, I'm, I've definitely not taken anywhere near as many animals as you, but I prefer to kind of get out and adventure a little bit more than yeah. sit off something. Yeah, and, you know, doing it that way, you, you do see a lot more country and – You'll, you'll find, you know, you'll learn a bit more about that area you're in, you know, where everything is. You might pick up a different little spring or a, or a different water hole, you know, just from just from having a bit of a walk about and seeing what's around. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, it just gives you a bit better idea of, of what's around you and getting to know your place sort of thing. And so when it comes to boars, like, um, is, there, is there ones that you kind of are really chasing? Like, what's the biggest one you've got in regards to the tusks and then how, how big, like, is it, is, do you kind of have a standard or are you kind of any boars a, a good boar? Uh, no, I, I do. Like, I won't shoot a, a sort of, you know, an immature boar just because he's there. I'll, I'll sort of let him go and... And I'll try and track them down in a few seasons' time, you know. But um, you know, where do all your old boars come from? You know, from, exactly. from being young, young yeah. boars at some time. So you know, uh, there's no point sort of just shooting him because he's there. You know, um, you know, yeah, you're not really. There's nothing to be proud of about shooting a, a bloody, you know, an immature boar if if you know you've already shot, you know, twenty in your lifetime before that, you know, like, exactly, yeah. Um, you know, so I sort of tend just to let them, them younger fellas go and, um, you know, concentrate on those bigger guys if they're about, um, but yeah, in regards to, you know, I don't really have a standard, but you know, you can tell a good ball when you see him. Um, um, and if he's really good, you'll see his teeth sticking out. Was there ever um, a bit of a transition for you? Like, was it ever uh, kind of nothing was safe to now it's more so you're you're hunting for specific animals? Oh, most definitely, mate. Like, I mean, the further down the old bow hunting track you get, I think the more you start to um, take responsibility for your actions mm-hmm. of being able to kill an animal, um, you know, of you basically – being the decider of whether that animal lives or not, lives or mm. whether he, you know, whether he dies right here this afternoon or this morning or whatever, and and once you sort of, I suppose, achieve a bit, not not you know trying to say that of, you know, I'm sitting way up high above everyone else or anything, but yeah, once you do kill a few good animals, um, you know, you I think you do start to appreciate how long that took that animal to get to where he was when you killed him. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, and so, you know, yeah, you'll see a, you'll see a younger pig and you're pretty happy just to let him walk because he's not, um, he's nothing special. You know, he's, there's, there's no point. He's not using, him. there's no appreciation in, in, in killing a young boar for, for, for myself anyway. You know, I'm sure, you know, when I was starting out um, and you saw, you know, you saw a, a big young boar, like he was had the body size, but he just didn't have the maturity, and you know the, the teeth weren't there or what have you. No ripped ears, you know it didn't matter. You were going to put an arrow in him because yeah. you thought you thought he was the the one you wanted, you know. But um, yeah, and I'm sure that's the same with everyone. Yeah, no, definitely. I, th- I think I'm still in the early stages. Like, it- it's interesting as I've kind of progressed. Like, I've definitely done some things out in the bush that I would call mistakes and things that I would probably regret. Whereas as I've, as I've matured into it um, and had a few years under my belt and like recent hunts, although I'm not necessarily getting animals that are uh, um, of trophy level to any state, like it's still, it's a step up from where I was and I'm a lot more happy with 
my whole process as to how it's all gone down. It's like a, yeah. a hell of a lot more cleaner. Like the animals are, are done within within like the the ten to fifteen meters from where you shoot them. Um, yeah, and it's just like the process itself is actually really neatened up in regards to it's the I've become the hunter that I wanted to become. But now it's yeah. I guess it's just about time on the ground from here. Yeah, for sure, and and it's a journey for everyone, and you know. Um, yeah, like you use the word, you know, as you mature as a hunter or whatever, uh, which is a great description. Yeah, you know, different things change for you. Uh, you, you know, you look at things a different way, and um, yeah, you know, what you were happy with to kill, you know, twelve months ago, you know, might not be really what you're looking for at the moment. Yeah. And in another twelve months, you know, you will have moved on again, and you know, you might you'll be looking for for a different, you know, class of animal or, or whatever, you know, depending on, you know, what you're, what you're hunting for, you know, if, if you're, you know, shooting meat is obviously probably quite different completely. Um, mm-hmm. You're not going to you know, shoot an old ranging mongrel pig. You know, you kind of probably look for a, for a younger animal, um, you know, altogether for that, for that purpose of what you're going to use it for. But uh, yeah, now there's definitely a journey and, and you will um, change from the beginning to the end. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and so in regards to the meat slash trophy thing, do you, do you kind of ever do it for meat or is it all kind of at the moment just, just for the hunting side of things? Just for the hunting, mate. You know, with the species up here, um, you know, you, you could shoot you know, a sow off the floodplain, have done plenty of times before, and, um, you know, take it for a bit of meat. Um but mostly these days, you know, if I if I shoot an animal, it's it's because he's a, you know, something I was looking for trophy wise or yeah. maturity wise, you know. Um, yeah, there's plenty of plenty of wild cattle around that that occasionally you'll get an arrow, and that's pretty much purely for for meat. Uh-huh. Um, scrub bulls, like shooting scrub bulls, really isn't a, a you know like it's a bit the same as a buffalo. I can take it or leave it. Yeah. So, um, most of the time I'll leave it, but you know, if there's a, if there's a clean skin cow poking around and she's pretty fat or whatever, and you got the chance, then yeah, you, you know, you, we'll take her for meat. And obviously there's quite a fair bit in one. So, um, I was about to say that, how does that process look like? Are you kind of butchering the whole thing or? Whole thing, mate. Yeah. So you'll just break her up on the ground. Yeah. Um, take your back straps and your shoulders. Yeah, your rumps, your ribs, your fillets, your knuckles, top sides. Yeah, there's not a lot left at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, not a lot of waste. That's uh, unreal. Just, that's a that's a yeah. freezer full for a long time. Oh, for sure, mate. Yeah, it'll last you 12 months on average. Well, for us, um, yeah, you'll get 12 months out of one. Yeah. Yeah, that's unreal. And so when it yeah. comes to that, like, uh, obviously the land you're on is it's private property. And so is that correct? Yeah, so, I mean... Um, most most of the places are private property, so you know you got to do your homework when it comes to uh, the cattle that are on there because they're all worth money. Yeah. But, um, you know you do. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't uh, just go shooting any old <laughs> no, any old cow with you, know, you might find yourself in a bit of strife. But <laughs> yeah, not. do your homework. Uh, definitely, yeah. there's places there where you wouldn't wouldn't dare lose an arrow at one, uh, and then there's other places that that are really that way. Uh, yeah, they, they don't mind you taking one if there's one there sort of thing. They've got other interests with that place than, um, than cat, you know, the wild cattle that are on it sort of thing. And is it kind of like you're, you're basing on if the cow's branded versus if it's – or or if it's tagged or whatever? Um, is yeah. that kind of the insights you're looking for? Definitely, mate. Yeah, so a clean skin animal is, is something that's never been through a cattle yard. So it's been born out in the bush uh, and it's wild. There's no, you know, it hasn't been through a yard and got an ear, earmark or a brand or an ear tag or it doesn't, you know, this is a pretty loose term, but um, it doesn't really have an odour. Yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not, I mean, you know, people will argue with you that, that the station that it's living on is, is who owns it. But, um, you know, if it's, <clears throat> if it's on a, uh, like a, na- a nature reserve, for instance, say, yeah. Um, you know, people aren't going to claim ownership of that animal no. because it's wild. You know, they will just cull it along with a pig and a buffalo and any other invasive species that are sitting there grazing alongside of it. So um, in, in that respect, yeah, it, it's a wild animal that, that can be shot and used for meat. Um, 
and, and no one's going to mind, you know. No, I've seen, uh, I only recently saw it, how they actually go and muster up the, the scrub balls and capture them. And they, um, yep, they've yep. got like the big arms that hang off of the truck or off of the ute as they drive up and they'll like pin the animal to the truck essentially and they tie it up yeah. by the horns to a to a um a tree and then they'll drive off like they just leave them there overnight until they come back the next morning to collect them up on the truck yeah that's the way yeah, yeah. It, absolutely bizarre like i've never seen anything like it and i think it's just absolutely like it'd be it'd be pretty fun work but pretty pretty daunting work as well uh with it yeah definitely um oh yeah definitely hard work but uh it is a lot of fun yeah is that yeah, is that any of the stuff that you do, or is it more like the big musterings? No, we do we do a lot of um, like panel yards, or like they they say run a yard. So they'll take a portable yard and yep. um, and build it, you know, in an area where there's a lot of cattle. Most of the time, uh, a lot of clean skin cattle, and yeah, just set up a big hessian wing, and and you'll go out and just muster an area and bring all those cattle to a you know a central spot. Usually, if you can find a a bit of a camp there where they like to stand up without, you know, having to hold them there yourself, um, you know, and just bring them all up and stand them up there on the camp or there might be a bit of a water hole there that they, they'll stand there for the morning and have a drink and chew their card and then once you've got everything in there, yeah, sort of bring them off that, that camp or the, or the water and, yeah, run them up into the wings and, and put them in the yard. Yeah, that's unreal. It's um. Very, very different world up there. It's a lot, lot bigger open spaces compared to a lot of the farming land that I've seen and been used to. And yeah, just a, a bit of a different world. It's unreal. Yeah, for sure. But um, yeah, yeah, I'd highly recommend anyone if that was their interest in coming up and doing a year. You know, um, you know, the, yeah, the, the experience you'll gain and the things you'll see is, you will change your life. I, I reckon. You know, you'll you'll come away from at the end of the day with a different outlook and. Uh, a different perspective on hard work, that's for sure. Yeah, it's actually something I did. I definitely, um, I regret not doing was going out and doing a year of jackarooing or at least yep. some time of jackarooing because we had access. I had access to it. My brother went and did it, um, and I saw my uncle the other day, and I said to him, like, mate, it's actually one thing I really regret not doing was going out and spending kind of a few months at least with him and stuff. But um, I was in a band and we were just touring so much. So it just didn't kind of fit into my time of life, unfortunately. But I think it's it's come back around to me now that I really love the land anyway. It's kind of, yeah, it's come back to me, I guess, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a bloody great thing to do. If you're, at, you know, straight out of high school and looking for a gap year or something like that, plenty of guys have come up and done that and never gone home again, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they've made a they made a career out of it, sort of thing. Yeah, that's unreal. Um, and so, let's talk about setup for the gear that you're kind of rolling with. I've, I've heard different stories about um, how much weight you need in arrows and and how much poundage you need to be able to go up to to Northern Territory or to the Cape or anything like that to be able to shoot the bulls or even the the pigs that are getting around, some of the boars that are getting around. Can you kind of give us a little yes. bit more insights as to what you're rolling with and and um, your thoughts and concepts around it as well? Yeah, so I shoot a option seven, elite option seven. It's yep. a seventy pound bow. Um, not yeah, just twenty eight inch draw, nothing outrageously long. I think it, it shoots about two eighty five feet a second or something like that. Yep. Uh, so it's not you know it's not blazing away. It's um, just poking along pretty steady. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll shoot. I think a five. Some arrows I'll run at like 530, 540, usually with a 150 grain two blade Oz cut up the front. Yep. 150, um, did you pretty, say? 150, yep. yep. Uh, that's a pretty standard setup for me. And then I will usually run a few 185 Oz cuts as well, those, um, those bit heavier ones. Uh huh. Um, you know, I, I don't tend to shoot stuff very far away. So. No. Having the div, the variance in a bit of weight on the broadhead doesn't really affect my setup. Um, you know, further shot I'll do is like thirty yards, and that's that's like a that's a long shot for me. Yeah, uh, most of the time. So anything closer than that isn't really going to make too much difference for me. Or, or, you know, that I found, um, but it gives you that little bit extra weight. So you know, I'll probably go between five forty and you know five eighty something like that. Um, but in saying that. I've shot buffalo bulls and, and, and big boars with both of those arrow setups. And, you know, I've never had an issue with not getting the arrow to go enough 
penetration or, um, you know, I think, to be honest, if you, if you shoot an animal and you hit, it, hit a leg bone, especially a big animal, unless you're packing some serious weight and, and some serious poundage, I, I think you're going to be, um, you know, left on the on the losing side of that battle. Yeah, definitely. Whether, you know, you know, depending, you know, whatever setup you've got. Um, you know, I read a book once. Well, that Ed Ashby, who said the magic number of split and bone is 650 grains. Yeah, wow. Um, so, you know, I mean, I've never really put it into practice, but, um, you know, so, you know, according to that, if you shoot an animal in, in the leg bone, you know, a serious piece of bone with an arrow that's less than 650 grains, you're probably going to, uh, you know, yeah, lose that one. So, yeah, but 550 580 don't hit any bone <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll punch a you'll punch a big bull you know straight in one side and halfway at the other yeah or you know you're straight in one side and out the other side and keep going on a ball you know, yeah, yeah. Right. um yeah you know i guess if you were shooting a lot of poundage and and even still with your heavy arrow they'd say you know yeah you'll still do all right but um yeah for that that's worked for me and, um, yeah, they haven't had any issues with it. Yeah, I heard an interesting conversation the other day. Um, a, there was a female hunter, and she kind of brought up the whole thing that a lot of uh, a lot of men in particular don't have to worry about the same things that the women do when they're out in the bush hunting, in particular on those bigger animals, because they have to really be, like, super conscious of, of uh, placement because of even rib bones and things like that can be a big issue for um, for a female that doesn't have as much of a, a poundage or as, as much of a heavy yep. arrow as what we do. Um, whereas for, yeah, like like I think it's quite common for, for men within Australia in particular to have an arrow that's anywhere between five to 600 grains. Like that's that's pretty common. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not chasing, oh, red, I'm chasing reds down here and I'm running yep. about a 580 grain arrow, which is kind of the heaviest yep. end that you'd be rolling, which is interesting. But I'd never really thought of the concept of, uh, even having to worry about that, like I, I don't worry about if I was to hit a rib bone. I don't think that would be much of an issue for really probably any of the animals within Australia, right? No, no, I don't think so. Um, yeah, you know, you don't you don't pull your bow back and and go, you know, aiming in that area and say, oh, geez, I hope I don't hit a rib bone. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, you know, it doesn't even enter your mind. You know, you you're happy you do hit a rib bone because. <laughs> What are the ribs protect your, your vitals, your exactly. heart, and your lung? Yeah, you know, it's right. It's right where you're aiming. Uh, I don't know. I just guess. Yeah, it's not a. It's not something you think about. It's not an issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, them those bigger shoulder bones, leg bones, might be a different story. But um, yeah, I mean, if you're running an arrow right around sort of that five, five to six hundred, oh, yeah, it's fine. I reckon yeah, that'll definitely. do the job every time. How, how do you find the elite? You liking it? Uh, I do, mate. Yep. Um, yeah. I haven't had any troubles shooting it. I used to have a, a Bowtech RPM 360. Yep. And that, it was just too quick. Uh, you know, just a bit too unforgiving. And, um, you know, you could shoot it all right one day and then the next day you'd sort of have a fair bit of trouble with it. Yeah, and fine. then swapped it out for... For what I have now, and and yeah, haven't looked back. It's it's been spot on. Um, yeah, just an easy to shoot bow, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's great. You know, yeah. That's unreal. Yeah. Stringing cables every eighteen months, and do you and do it yourself? Get... No, nah, I send it away. I have a little press up here, and yeah. Um, you know, it's being up here. There's not a lot. I don't think there's any archery shops even say. in Darwin anymore. Yeah, so uh, I usually just send it down to a mate. Um, back around Tamworth there and um, yeah, he'll press it up for me and get it all shooting to spec and then send him back. So How do you send it? Uh, like what are you, are you kind of covering it completely in foam and whatever else when you send it in the mail? Yeah, so the last time I sent it, it was in the mail and yeah, I just got a cardboard box and wrapped it in bubble wrap and yep. sent it down. Um, but if I can help it and I'm going down for Christmas or something like that yeah, back home, do that. yeah, I'll just take it with me and and uh, you just have all the gear ordered and ready to go and, uh, you know, just yeah, duck up and put it through the press one afternoon and, and get it going. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a better way to do it. I think you can 
keep track of your gear. Um, but yeah, at, at a pinch in the post, yeah. get it down and get it back. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I, I'm actually just looking at, or I've pretty much secured myself a new elite cure, which I'm absolutely stoked for. It's, it's a second oh, yeah, hand nice. bow and he's just restringing yep. it for me now. And then, um, it'll be hopefully all mine, which is unreal. So, but with that also, I'm going to be getting rid of my bow. So I was like, Hmm, it's probably something I need to start thinking about is how, how I'm going to send it. If I, if I do sell it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, just, um, it can get pretty expensive if you're trying to do, uh, uh, what are they, you know, um, like there's parcel post and then you've got express. Yeah. So express is like, it's crazy. I think 400 bucks or something like that. <sighs> Jesus. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So it'll get dear quick if, uh, if you do that, but just parcel post, I think it's still a little bit expensive. It might be a couple of hundred bucks, but, um, yeah, it'll serve the purpose of getting it down and getting it back and and uh, yeah, keeping track of it and everything. So that's just one thing to watch out for. If yeah, you definitely. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. I might um, or just obviously put at, at buyer's expense. <laughs> yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Um, so, I mean, tell us about the annual trip that you guys do. You kind of always do an annual trip up to Northern Territory. So, obviously, it's the boys coming up to be uh, closer to you or around you. What does that kind of look like? What's it entail? How long do you guys go out for? What's the, what's the whole setup? Right. So, usually, it's a couple of week trip. Um, we do. We've been doing it every year since about 2016 or 17. Yep. Uh, the normal crew is usually uh, Dano and Jake, myself and Adam McCulloch. Yep. Adam usually comes up for a run. Um, this year was a little different. Ads couldn't make it. Um, so it was just just myself, Dan, Jake and Keith, our dad. Yeah. Um, they came up. We didn't know if we were going to get away with it this year with COVID, uh, obviously with the borders being shut to New South for a period. Um and then it reopened. We locked it in. Um, we obviously had the band tang lined up. Just needed the the borders to to open up um, to make it happen. So yeah, we locked it in. I think it was for the beginning of August. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, yeah, Dad and Dad, I ended up leaving early. Uh, and I think they got up here two days later or three days later. They shut the borders again behind them. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, we just made it through, but yeah, so this year was two weeks trip um, with a week up in Coburg and a week just on the floodplain on a place I have access to. Um, so yeah, it was a pretty, pretty awesome trip. We um, didn't find too many pigs on, on the floodplain this year. It was still quite wet, um, probably needed another month or so to really dry out enough so you can get, get right out in amongst that floodplain. Um, so it, it did find, make it a bit hard to find them pigs. Um, yeah, you just sort of walk on the edge of the floodplain and trying to find them here and there. But um, So do they actually, do they shift off during that time or they're just in, in the thick of it all? No, nah, they'll, they'll shift around a bit, mate. Um, yeah, because that, that floodplain dries back fairly quickly, so that water's always moving back and back and back. Yeah. So uh, they're sort of, and they'll follow it, you know, from the edge, you know, and then it'll go back to another shallow spot that might be, you know, another 100 yards out and you'll see their pad and they'll get out there and it might be on a little bit of a higher spot that's dry and they'll live out there and it just makes it a little bit trickier to, to track them down. Yeah. Um, but, you know, earlier in the year that up on the ridge, a lot of those gullies are still running and have water so they can live up there too if they want. Yeah, um, okay. The beauty about this time of year is, yeah, there's not a lot of water left around until it starts raining, so... Um, you know, the floodplain's dry. You can access it on foot uh, and really bloody spread out and, and find them spots where they're still sort of hanging out. But, um, so if someone from outside of uh, NT was looking to kind of go up that way, you'd recommend almost going like September, October, November even? Yeah, it's hot and, and it will like nearly kill you yep. if you're not used to hot weather. Like it's even hot for the you know, local blokes poking around. Um yeah, like it's it's bullshit hot. Yeah, and, you know you will do a lot of sweating, um, but it is a great time to be out looking around, especially if you know a couple of handy little spots where um, you know there's always that last bit of water. It's always sh- you know produced a few animals before. Yeah, it's it's bloody, it's 
it makes for some good hunting. That's the best thing about up here, I, I reckon. It's whether you like it or not, it's inaccessible six months of the year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to those spots, you know, that are too wet. Yeah. I'm, so it always gets a break, sort of thing. I remember, um, I remember going into Darwin. We we're on our way to Southeast Asia. We we're doing a, a tour through there with the band back in the day, and I got into like we literally hopped off the plane. And even in the Darwin Airport, they had the aircon. You walked out, and it was like you stepped into a sauna. Like it was, it was almost yeah. hard to breathe coming from the, the yeah. aircon of the plane and coming from Brisbane, which was not that hot at that time. I think it was, I think it was December, like early December, or it was January or something like that. It was right in the in the thick of summer, and yeah, it yeah. was. It yeah, it's was almost hot. a line. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, the electric doors of the airport open, and yeah, it's um, invisible line there. It just just about slaps you in the face if you've been been home for a, for a few weeks and you come back again. But um, but yeah, but it is it is hard work out there poking around in the heat of the day. Um, What's that look like catch, for you guys catch, going out yeah. camping? Then, like, how much water are, you, are the boys kind of having to take out? So I I got a three liter bladder in my pack. Um, so I'll always have that full and I'll usually carry like a liter and a half bottle, uh, s- spare as well. Yep. Um, most of the time we'll sort of drive to a, you know, a half central point where we can hunt from and then, um, and then walk from there. Yeah. Okay. So we and we usually have, you know, an esky in the ute with some cold water once you get back there. So, you know, chances are drinking four and a half liters in an afternoon are pretty slim. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, you, you you will burn through. You know, if you're going for a weekend, you'd probably do your twenty liters between a couple of guys, pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and how about like in regards to your pack? What are you kind of taking around when you're up there? Uh, so I've always got a first aid kit. Yep. Um, GPS, EPIRB, uh Most of the time. That's the uh, the the button one, right? You press it and you can kind of get saved wherever you are. That's it, yeah. So just yeah, just your standard handheld EPIRB. You, you, yeah, you flip the switch and um, it'll send out a location uh, on the beacon. Yeah. And it's heard, heard, you know, by passing aircraft in the airports. Yeah, it, it sends out a fr- on a frequency uh, that aircraft can listen to. Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, if, if something goes really bad, uh, you can hit that EPIRB and just sort of sit tight and uh, someone will, yeah, won't, will be there within a few hours. Yeah. Um, you know, just a little bit of food, nothing, uh, nothing outrageous. A few music bars, stuff like that. Knife, um, head torch, your, your standard stuff. You yeah, know. yeah. Some, oh, sometimes we'll, we'll take a rifle with us, um, just you know, as a bit of a cheap insurance <laughs> if you get in a bad situation with a, you know, a buffalo bull or a you know, you, you know, big cranky boar that's been wounded or something in that long grass. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, obviously you try and do your utmost to keep out of those situations, but <laughs> I'd rather rather have that and not need it than need it and not have it, you know. it's um. And so is it is it kind of like you're deciding who's hunting for the day and someone's carrying the rifle then as a backup? Well, I just normally stick it in my pack. Okay. Um, so it'll, it'll fit in there fairly easy and, uh, you know, yeah. If a situation comes along that you need it, um, you know, yeah, you can grab it out fairly quickly and, um, you know, do what you've got to do. But, yeah, we, like, I've never really had to use it. Um, we've had it out a few times just in case things go sideways. But, yeah. Um, yeah. I've never had to shoot a charging buffalo or, or anything even remotely close to that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, okay. And so the Bentang uh, chasing them around, like, is there... Is there much difference between them and the the other buff that you see, the water buff? Um, not particularly, mate. I don't think. Um, and actually, you know, scrub they're... bulls as well. Like, are they all pretty similar in regards to their their actions and what they do? Yeah, I mean, a, a scrub bull and a bantam bull are, you know, well, they're the same species, I guess. They're all a bovine animal. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they're a bit different looking and a little bit differently built. Um, I don't know. We didn't have any trouble with ours. I have spoken with Pato at Dingo Creek about it. He's had he's had plenty of bulls, or well, not plenty, you know, one or two bulls just charge. No reason at all. Just yeah, wow. Well. Bump them, bump them coming through the bush, and um, yeah, they come over and give the boys a bit of a hurry up. Yeah. But 
Um, you know, I've never seen Scrub Bull do that, uh, or or a Buffalo Bull for that matter, just chase chase someone out of the blue for no apparent reason. So um, yeah, once we once we were up in Coburg there and we talked to a few guys in camp, um, yeah, I think it was the general consensus that yeah they'll they'll chase you a bit quick more, more quickly than uh than just your, your average scrub bull or your buffalo but as i said we we didn't have any trouble at all um with any of that business so yeah that was pretty good but uh it does happen apparently yeah that that one the bull that you've posted up of jake's um the bantang that he got at dingo creek hunting um it's it looks almost like more like a, a bull than it does like a scrub bull than it does a, a bantang, right? Yeah, yeah. Like the colouring and everything of it is is there the cases where they're actually interbreeding or? I don't think so. They, I don't think they would up there. Apparently, there isn't any scrub cattle living okay. up in the peninsula. Yep. Um, from what I was told by a couple of rangers and and guys and that, um, no, not a lot of people see them at all up there, but you know, like you get that red color, they start out red or that orange yep. as a young animal. Okay. Uh, all, your, all your cows are orange. Um, all them young bulls are orange and then they'll grow out a bit and they'll turn that black and white color. Okay. And yep. they reckon once they're getting onto the, the back nine of their life again, then they'll go a red, they'll go that red tan color again. Uh, so that's what's happened with this one that Jake took? We think. Because um, he I looks mean, like a big he, bull. Oh man, he just looked cool as hell. And, yeah. Um, you see him on the hoof there that morning. He, he, you know, he was just like, yeah, absolutely. That's the one we want. Um, yeah, he, he was cool as hell in mad colours and, you know, just very different to your, your typical Bantang bull, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah, with that, that sort of orangey colour, I'd say he, he's getting toward, you know, the, the back end of his years and he's starting to go that, that colour again, yeah. Yeah, there you go. And so something like those ones, um, like what's the deal with, with those animals? Are you guys, are you keeping them for Euro mounts or anything? You, like uh, does the meat get utilised? What's the what's the go? Is there like deals with the Dingo Creek that they kind of they kind of provide stuff for it? Yeah, so for us, um, we, we caped all of ours um, and we're getting sent away for a mount. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, we took meat off, off all three of those bulls we got. Um, just for camp, um, it eats pretty good. Yeah, Bantang just in a like yeah, didn't steak it or anything, just cut it up into a stew. But um, we yeah, we eat plenty of Bantang in camp there uh, over the week, and yeah, it eats, eats, eats just fine. Um, Is it just pretty similar to cattle to cow? Yeah, I mean in a stew, it's a little hard to tell. I'm sure if you you cut a steak and and put it in a pan, you'd, you'd see the difference maybe. right away. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people say it's like really oily, yeah, um, okay. and you you need like a hot drink with it to <laughs> like a hot hot drink of tea or something Cleanse to the melt palate. <laughs> yeah, you know, to melt the grease out of your mouth, which yeah. <laughs> doesn't sound very bloody appetising. But um, you know, in, in a stew, it was it was fine. Yeah, I mean, it was great, Tucker. And so, you, are you getting? Uh, you said you're getting mounts done. You're not just caping them and just getting the hides done. You're actually getting a mount. Yeah, so um, just shoulder mount. So yeah, wow. Yeah, just split them down over the neck and, um, you know, around. Well, we took them a, bit, a little way back just to make sure we had enough. But, yeah, just your standard shoulder mount cape um, is how we took them. And uh, then, yeah, take them back to camp and, and face cape them and sold them down and pack them all up and bring them home, yeah. Wow, that's going to be incredible. It's a, it's a big thing to hang on the wall. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, obviously – you're not going to shoot, you know, you, you probably only shoot one in your life, maybe two. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's the first mounts we've ever got done. But, um, yeah, we just thought, well, you know, how, how often are we going to get to do this? Probably not that often. And so, you know, we wanted to, uh, yeah, get a mount and I reckon it's going to look cool as hell. I'm keen as to get mine back. Yeah, definitely. And so have you, like, have you got other things at home kind of hanging around? You've got other, other like, Euro mounts or anything or capes? Yeah, plenty of Euro mounts, mate. Um, just big, big buffalo bulls. Yeah. Um, and and pig jaws. You'll probably uh, you ask my wife how many pig jaws we have sitting around. Is <laughs> probably way too many for her liking. But um, that's that's sort of yeah, like uh, yeah, plenty of pig jaws and and buffalo skulls and different things. Um, 
but yeah, that's that's a bit hard. It. I haven't. It's kind haven't of a, a good other. reminder, right, of of each experience. Yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, a lot of people are interested in in that sort of stuff. Um, you know, when you if you got one hanging in the house or on the veranda or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, even your pig jaws, like they're not yeah, unless you're into that sort of thing. I mean, um, it's not really something that people seek out. But if they see them presented on a you know a nice bit of wood or something, and they're all polished up and um, bleached up, you know, it does look good. And yeah, a lot of people sort of take note of them. And um, yeah, always plenty of conversations or stories that come out yeah yeah i got my uh i got a goat hide done recently i've been showing it off like crazy like i'm so proud of how it's kind of worked out yep. um it just hangs over our couch but still if someone comes to the house i'm like oh check this out <laughs> show it off real quick yeah for sure <laughs> yeah no nah, hides are bloody great um i reckon i i wouldn't want actually getting a, I obviously had the choice between getting the the uh shoulder mount on a bantang or his hide but i reckon he's hide. you know that black and white um would look bloody awesome tanned up on the floor as well. Yeah, I was thinking that with, um, in particular, one that, that Jake got that, that reddy or orangey colour he's got, that would yeah. be incredible as a cape. For sure. And, you know, they'd be rare as not many people would have a Bantang hide no. for the floor, you know? No, definitely not. So um, tell us a little bit more about your experience with, with outfitters in general. Like, have you kind of used them quite a lot up there? Nah, to be honest, mate, um, that week with, with Dingo Creek, that was the first paid hunt trip we'd ever done yeah cool so so um yeah we were definitely newbies at um at going up and and having someone guide you or you know yeah look after you for the week um but you know it it was a great experience buddy if anyone listening wants to shoot a bantang yeah definitely give dingo creek ring they're uh they got an awesome camp right on the beach there up on this high bank just overlooks that raffles bay um yeah, buddy, bush camp, aircon room, uh, you know, a big kitchen set up there, shower, flush and toilet. You're not roughing it by any means. No, um, definitely not. And, you know, yeah, then there's, you know, it might not take you. It's great hunting up there at the moment. Um, oh, I heard, you know, this is not official news or anything, but uh, back in the day they say there was like three outfitters uh, doing but doing bantang back in the day. Um, I think there's only two up there now, and they're so far apart that you know the animals are just they're everywhere, mate. Like we, yeah, we okay. got our three bulls out of the, the same patch of of country three three days in a row. Yeah, yeah, um, wow. You know, and, and we we barely scratched the surface of the area we had. Was it kind of like you found the bull and went straight for it, or were you were you picky with the ones that you actually wanted to go for? We were definitely picky. Yeah. Um, we, we weren't shooting the first animal we saw sort of thing. Um, but it, it didn't take take too long to find quality animals, um, you know, and, and get a, get the job done sort of thing. Um, yeah, like Dano's bull, that was the first bull um, of, of the trip on the first afternoon. So we went out, um, had a look around some big marine planes there, and it's just sort of all intersected with marine marine creeks and big swamps. And, yeah. um, you know, yeah, you, you'll go down through one creek and you'll come up out the other side and, and there'll be another big flat and you just – there's there's animals on every flat and you just slug glass and having a look through them all. Nothing there that really takes your fancy. Oh, we'll poke around you and have another look. But yeah, well, honestly, it, it does not take long. You will, you will run into a lot of animals. Yeah, that's um, cool. Yeah, you know, it's it's a great place. Yeah, so, and you know, if you know, it doesn't take too long to to get your animal, um, and you know, your hunting part might be done, but the fishing up there is unreal. Off its face. Yeah, yeah uh, we were in camp with Nick Joyce for the week. Uh, he had his tinny up there. We went and done some fishing one morning. Then yeah, like it was, you, you barely even had time to sit down. Like it was. <laughs> It was great. Like, it's just a good place to be. Is it all um, barra? Yeah. Like, is that what you're chasing? No, I don't, we didn't catch any barra. So we were just launched off the beach. Um, and, you know, there's, like, just, like, rocky reef not yeah. far off the coast. Uh, there's a bit of an island out there. We just sort of cruised around that general area and just, yeah, just trolling lures and picked up queenies and wow. big mackerel. Uh, Dano hooked up on a sailfish. Oh. 
like sight cast at a sailfish. We were standing there and he'd come up to the boat and we flicked a lure at it and it took its took it took his lure. It was only a little one, might have been a meter or something. Yeah, like just ridiculous stuff. Um we end up losing it, which was a bit of a bummer, but yeah, it, just a cool experience, you know. Yeah. Um, to see one around the boat, you not not far offshore. Um that's unreal. Yeah, so there's yeah, tons of stuff to do up there, mate. Like, yeah, go and get a bull, spend a few days fishing. It's just a cool place to be, yeah. Yeah, that sounds incredible. And so um, if you were to take new bow hunters out, what would be some enlightenment you'd give them? Like, is there any, any sort of tips you have for someone who's getting into the sport? Oh, mate, I'd reckon just try and um, be sure of your shot. Like mm. like we were talking earlier, uh, you know, you, you, maturity does come down the track, um, it, you know, it's obviously it's quite an exciting sport, uh, especially when you're hunting with a bow. Um, you know, people just sort of want to get get the job done, you know. Yeah. Um, but just taking taking your time, those few extra minutes to get that animal, you know, to give give yourself every chance at killing that animal. Well, if that means waiting an extra minute for him to to be perfectly broadside, or for him to stand clear of that bush or for you to get another five yards closer, just that's what I would say. Yeah. Make sure you're doing that stuff. Give yourself every chance to, to do that job and do it well. Um, trust me, there's nothing worse than, than wounding a quality animal all because you knew you should have got closer or you yeah, should have let him take definitely. that extra step. And, and, you know, like the disappointment that comes with with you, you know, wounding the animal and losing it will far outweighs the disappointment that comes with him, uh, you know, just, you know, walking off out of bow range and, and disappearing into the long grass, you know. And at the end of the day, he's still going to be there next week. He yeah. Can come back and have another try. But if you wound him, good chance that he'll poke off and die somewhere that you'll never find him and then he's gone forever then. Yeah, so. Yeah, I like that. That would be my advice. I I think it kind of gets lost a little bit in regards to the the footage and whatever else you can see now. Like, I've been watching um, Bow Life a little bit recently, which is Levi Morgan's show. And he'll yep. he'll punch out to a hundred yards like he's doing long shots like really long Price. shots and and you see yep. obviously he's a he's the top of the world like he is the one the, at the moment seen as the best um, archer in Australia, in the world but yep. it still gives off a a sense as like oh that's something that's very achievable and that's something that anyone could do and I think it For would sure. make people probably take shots that are like you said over thirty yards um, or thirty meters or whatever so yeah I really like that that's that's kind of uh, I think that's awesome advice yeah I mean that's just coming from me who's uh, who's had to figure that out for myself yeah um, yeah it, it, and it does take a lot of willpower and stuff mm-hmm. and maturity uh, to to sort of you know, especially if it's a quality animal um, and you just want him. And, uh, you know, yeah, to make yourself take that extra time uh, to do the best job you can does take a bit of willpower and, um, yeah. But it, it, it will pay you back when you got him there on the ground and you're touching him versus never seeing him again, yeah. Yeah, no, 100% agree. And then um, last thing, what uh, is there any near misses that you've had? Animal encounters? Uh, sorry, mate? Is there, has there been any like near misses in regards to like animal encounters or anything like that? Like any any cases where you've been charged or, or had? Yeah. Uh, no, not particularly, mate. Never been chased by a buffalo. Um, I think I've had one boar shape up to me one time. <laughs> Uh, and that was just me pushing him, uh, you know, to a point where I, I gave him not much choice. Yeah, no. Nah. But to be honest, I've um, I've never had. I've been pretty lucky. Touch wood. Um, yeah, I've never had had anything really go sideways and uh, get injured or anything like that. No, nah. just that one time I was definitely pushing him, you know, way too much. I should have just but he uh, backed off and let him be there for a minute. Yeah. But uh, same thing again, you know, just that learning learning different things over the, the course of your of your bow hunting. Yeah. Yeah, I remember one time I was um I got onto this big sow and her, her little piglets were in the space where she was and she sniffed me and ran off but all the piglets stayed there. 
And as I got yep. closer up to the pigs, they just um, – she starts huffing at you. And, geez, it's like yep. your adrenaline dumps really quickly oh, when yeah. that's happening. <laughs> just, Intimidating yeah. those big old steers when they get to huffing. Oh, mate, yeah, and, it was freaky. Yeah, they – oh, yeah, you think there's some sort of monster in that grass going to come and get you. But, um, yeah, that's all good fun, all good to see it and a good experience to have out in the bush. Yeah, definitely. Oh, man, we might uh, we might wrap it up there. So, like I said, your your Instagram, which I think everyone should jump across and follow, is Cameron Outdoor – oh, sorry, Outside Bow Hunting. Um, that's the one. Yeah, and so, yeah, if anyone wants to kind of reach out, I think that's probably the best place. Would I be right there, Luke? Yeah, yeah, it's true. There's a message on there, mate. Um, yeah, any any three of us boys, me, Dano or Jake, flick a message and, um, yeah, we can get back to you with any questions or – what have what have you yeah nah, that's unreal mate and thank you very much for your time I really appreciate it no worries Matty thanks very much for having me on that wraps up this week's episode thank you so much for joining us team if you did have any topics questions or you wanted to suggest a guest for becoming a bow hunter you can send me an email at matty at becoming a bow hunter.com if you are enjoying the show or you've enjoyed in particular episodes please do me a solid and share it around with your friends if you are not already please hit the subscribe button as the more subscribers we get the higher the podcast gets ranked and that definitely helps out for sure showing it to other individuals. If you are not already following me on Instagram, it's at becomingabowhunter.podcast and on YouTube, it's becomingabowhunter. Get out team, fling some arrows, get that practice in and walk those yards in the paddocks until you find those critters. That is it for now, but not the last time that you'll hear from Becoming a Bowhunter. Hunter.